is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Robopocalypse, Part 5, Retaliation, Chapters 1 through 5, and Debriefing. The Fate of Tiberius, Freeborn. They shall not grow old. They shall grow not old. My bad. Dyad. Machines of Loving Grace. In these chapters, we find out just how Rob was overcome. But it doesn't actually seem like Rob was overcome. So my question is, one, oh no, and two, I don't like it. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Krista for commissioning this episode. Krista is in the chat. She is sore AF. Same. Um, for those who are interested, there is a patrons group for fitness, and we are currently in the midst of a challenge for the month of May. And uh, yeah, it is not so easy, it turns out. Um, so these chapters, guys, are wild because it really feels like this book feels like it should be longer. And I don't often say that because there's a, a certain economy of story that I tend to admire actually, but it feels like we just barely scratched the surface of a lot of what was happening in the world. And I think probably the major reason for that is because it's almost all concentrated in the United States. We don't really hear what happened in other countries. Um, oh, Krista says there's a sequel. See, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't like that because that implies that Rob did indeed manage to make a getaway, sent data somewhere, and uh, that makes me very upset. But she says, oh, it's so much more than that. Huh. Well, I don't have any problem with the fact that we were just in the United States, just for the record. I'm not trying to say that, like, it it feels like a failure on the author's part to not include that. Like, if anything, oftentimes authors will bite off more than they can chew. And they will put too many things at once and not really know how to wrap any of them up. It's just that when I finished the section last time... I was really surprised to realize that there was only one episode left and then it was going to be the end of the book because it just seemed like so much was happening and we really we really didn't get much of a look at how people were living in the midst of the war. We got to see the major points that were and, and again, see this is my thing. And I, I, I also run into this with, like, zombie stuff. I want to know about the minutia. And I know a lot of readers aren't like that. So this is probably a smart call on the part of the author to not include this stuff. But I'm just saying that for me, I'm just always interested in what about the people who aren't trying to go to Alaska to defeat Arcos? What's going on with them? How did they get by? What is, what's going on out there in communities? And, and how are people managing to make things work when they're not also trying to be heroes? Just my curiosity, because that, to be honest, is where I would be. You know, I'm not somebody who's going to be out on missions and, and quests, so to speak. And I always wonder about that. But I did find the ending really, even though it felt like it was sort of sudden, um, I thought it was well done. And, you know, because of the way the book starts, we know that by the end of this, Rob is going to be defeated. And there's a big asterisk after defeated, but you know. So it's not like there was... The tension on whether or not we win wasn't there. I can't decide if I like that or not. Part of me feels like you can't not have that and still have the recovery of all of this data 
regarding how the war went. Um, I, but I don't know, I guess somebody could stumble across this like black box and they aren't actually victorious yet. Um, but I just wanted to, you know, give my impressions on the book as a whole before I started getting into like plot stuff. Um, Krista says in Japan and England and Afghanistan. Oh, well, I, yeah, England, I was sort of like, hmm, sorry, England, wrapping up with the U.S. as an English speaking country. But you're right. I forgot about Japan and Afghanistan. Um, the main thing that I really like about the way that this book is written is the fact that it's obvious and, and we know, as Krista has pointed out, the author went to Carnegie Mellon. So it's not surprising that the author isn't technophobic. But I feel like this kind of story can come across that way sometimes. And I really appreciated that, one, he goes to great lengths to make sure that we understand why certain technology existed, because it was for our safety, because it was meant to improve the quality of our lives. So there's a lot to be said for, you know, like, for example, the technology regarding keeping cars from getting into collisions that would cause their, their, the whole way that they can detect one another and avoid casualties if they can. Um, I think that I had mentioned how the, like Owen had got a new car and we were doing our, uh, I was using cruise control one day and realized that the car slowed down automatically as the car ahead of me hit its brakes. And then when the car accelerated, my car accelerated as well. So it turns out my car has some sensors in it that I wasn't even aware of. It also yells at you. If you begin to cross lanes without your signal on, it beeps and tells you that you're out of your lane. And it does its best to stay within lane lines, even if you take your hands off the steering wheel for a second, or if you're holding the wheel a little bit too loosely, it will stay within lanes and it will tell you to put your fucking hands back on the wheel, basically. So uh, it was one of those things I was telling Owen that it's funny because I really do appreciate these features and I think that they probably make the car much safer. But it was weird to find out that our car did all of these things after just reading this, you know. Um, so anyway, I I appreciate that not only does he make sure to make it clear why a lot of the these technologies already existed, but then he makes the the victors in the end a combination of humans and robots, and he makes a robot the one who went down and actually defeated Rob and almost sacrificed himself. And I just think that that's like a really, it's a nice way to simultaneously bring in a new era where we're still going to be living with robots, evidently, but they're going to be a different type. They won't be servant machines that are mindless, you know, and um, also just make the conflict more interesting because when it's just humans versus robots, it, whether or not the author is technophobic to begin with, it can feel that way by the end of a story where robots are just uniformly the enemy. And when you see one, you know, it's a bad guy and you don't need to work on any subtlety in that. I just really liked this development. And um, I thought that it was sort of touching the way that it progressed. I would have liked, I think that was like the major reasoning for me feeling like the ending came a little bit too quickly for me. The awakening comes so close to the end of the book. And we really don't get to see that much about how the humans and robots allied together. I would have liked to see a little bit more of that. And it's not, it's sort of a thing where 
it would take the book being written in a slightly different style. So it's, I don't think that what I am looking for would necessarily have been easy to explain as being included in this narrative, because the point of the book is that it's a collection of stories of major moments during the war and sort of turning points. And of course, we're not just going to see a day in the life. We're going to see major obstacles being overcome. These moments where the technology has seemed to suddenly turn a corner and we're dealing with something brand new. So, you know, due to that, again, what I'm talking about, it makes sense that it isn't shown. But I have to imagine when, oh yeah, uh, Krista says also 902 is adorable, definitely. Um, I have to imagine that when 902 and his hoplite friend and his other friend um, joined up, that there was a pretty significant period of mistrust still amongst the humans. And that there were moments where they weren't sure if they could trust them or, you know, I, I would really love to see a little bit more of the adjustment and the ways in which they make use of having allies who don't have to sleep or eat. Um, because I'm just thinking about how great it would be. 902 doesn't have to eat, but I bet he can hunt like a motherfucker, right? So all of a sudden, you've got somebody who can stand sentinel all night and keep an eye out for enemies, and you all can get sleep, which would be amazing. And when it's like time for dinner, you don't have to do some elaborate thing while also looking out for enemies. You could just be like, hey, you want to go grab a couple rabbits? And this thing probably could go out and catch two rabbits in like 10 minutes and just be back. You know, I I really would love to see the advantages. And that said, you would have to walk a line between 902 being a ally and being a, seen as a servant. And that would also be interesting because the only, like, this is something Cormac specifically says, the only other robots that they've been working with have been essentially lobotomized. That probably takes a period of adjustment where it you are dealing with a robot, but they have a personhood to them that you haven't encountered before. And I'm sure it takes some adjustment to realize that. And how would 902 pick up on that? And how would he react to that? You know, it's just, there are a lot of questions about the relationship that would form. And that might be part of what a sequel copes with, because if we're, you know, transitioning into a sort of new era of robots and their relationship to people, um, I'm also really curious whether or not the technology that Rob created remains or if Rob's destruction somehow, if he has covered his own tracks and because, you know, he, we, we have robotic surgery already. Um, was what Rob was doing more advanced than anything that we had seen before? It sounds like it was. Like, people are genuinely surprised at what Rob was able to accomplish. So are we going to win against Rob and then be able to, like, use that technology to benefit ourselves again and actually sort of capitalize on Rob's advancements? Or... Is that a closed book to us because we as human beings haven't gotten there yet? I, I'm very curious about all this. So anyway, okay. Let's back up. Um, <clears throat> part five, retaliation. Starts with a quote from Richard Brotigan, 1967. I don't know who this is. Krista, I don't know if you know, but feel free to share if you do. And the quote is, I like to think it has to be of a cybernetic ecology where we are free of our labors and join back to nature 
return to our mammal brothers and sisters, and all watched over by machines of loving grace. Um. Oh, Krista says he's a character in Stephen King's stuff like Dark Tower. Richard Brodigan is in Dark Tower? I don't remember him. That doesn't surprise me, though, because those books had a billion characters. Um, so, number, chapter one, The Fate of Tiberius. Oh, she says he's also a real person. Oh, okay. Um, so the thing with Tiberius is truly fucked up, and it really was a matter of time before this was accomplishable. Is that a word? Um, because what... What happens here? It's just a forward movement of what we've seen already. So we had that whole scene with the coder who was in the nursing home, or maybe he was in a psych ward. I'm trying to remember. It might have been a combo. And he is talking to a person who has a really weird voice, and then he pulls the curtain aside. And Arcos has, like, built this weird mouth and lungs and tongue using all of the this like you know this these weird materials to imitate as well as possible a human voice and then we see that arcos has managed to like marry technology to human bodies and yeah it just it follows that eventually arcos is going to be able to take over dead human bodies i would be very curious if eventually, because we don't actually see this, and I'm curious because I had sort of not brought it up last episode due to the expectation that it would be dealt with in these chapters, and it's not. But there's the whole thing with um, Matilda not having a, as they call it, a governor with like installed with the rest of the technology that was installed into her eyes and brain. And this means that she has access to information that she shouldn't have as a, an unfettered human. But she's also friends with this dude who has the scissor hands and he doesn't seem like he has a governor either. So, I don't really understand is it is it that his hand is just of such a completely different nature that there isn't a necessity for a governor like he can just use his hand like scissors and that's all he can do so who cares but she has eyes and like information tapping into her brain and so that requires a different level of security i'm going to assume because he's also like the first person that this was done to i think they say or the first they know of um if that's the case then that stands to reason that there are other people out there because there are multiple work camps that this operation rob attempted to perform on matilda that there are multiple people out there upon whom this was done successfully, right? And um, Krista says, you're making me want to commission the second book. Girl, feel free. Yeah, we can do that. You would have to wait a little while because I'm pretty booked. But uh, if you want to commission the next one, I'm definitely interested in reading it. Um, but yeah, so it, like the whole way that Rob takes over as we see later dead bodies, uh, I really have to imagine the taking over of live bodies isn't exactly out of the realm of possibility either. I just don't know what that looks like because w if I don't know how the governor would work, would it keep her from even like living unless it was like, unless she was allowed to, or would it keep her from being able to access information, but otherwise she could still live like a person. And then all of a sudden Rob would take over her, you know, 
I don't know, her mind, her motor activity. I really don't know what Rob's goal was in installing this in the first place. What exactly is he trying to do? Is it just out of curiosity, just seeing what works? Is Rob, because, you know, the whole thing with Rob has been, and we see this toward the end, that there is an assumption that humans and robots cannot coexist. So is Rob attempting to make a new type of being and that way get around the conflict between humans and robots and hoping that like, well, if they're just as much robot as we are, then they won't be able to discriminate against themselves, you know? Um, But I do want to know what the deal is with that. I'm sorry. I am not like talking about anything in any sort of linear fashion. And I'm sure this is really frustrating. Um, so let me start off with reading like the opening for Tiberius. Almost three years after zero hour, Grey Horse Army reached within striking distance of our enemy, the Ragnarok intelligence fields. The challenges we found there were far different from any we had ever encountered. It is safe to say that we were in no way prepared for what was to come. The following scenes were recorded in great detail by a multitude of robotic weapons and spies deployed to protect the central AI known as Arcos. Additionally, these data are bolstered with my own recollections. So we start off with Tiberius already having been attacked. And this is really awful. The, we, you know, the whole boil bug thing I had thought was really the worst, but it looks like there's a new, uh, type of small Christus's stumpers in all caps. I'm sorry. I don't know. I boil bugs is what I'm pretty sure they're called. Um, there is this new, very small type of robot that basically gets into your bloodstream and like gets into your lungs and kills you that way is the way that I understand it. And that's what like winds up happening to Jack. Um, cause I, I said last episode, yeah, I'm assuming Jack is dead. <laughs> cause like he's just, he's the guy, you know, you definitely have to kill this guy. Eventually he's the one who's allegedly holding everything together. He's the hero. He's the guy who sacrifices himself and the guy who makes them all like gives them renewed determination. Um, so Tiberius has been hit with one of these, uh, I don't even remember what these things are called. Cause I don't think I'm trying to find the name of this one. They, they don't actually describe what it is that's happening to him a little bit later. Um, but let's see a golden sphere pops like a firecracker and bounces five meters into the air. Spinning there for a split second, the sphere sprays the area with dull red light before bouncing back to the ground dead. For an instant, each dancing snowflake is paused in the air, outlined in red. It's just a disco sensor. Um, Jack's grunting in my gut. I can feel the crosshairs trained on my brother. Move it, I scream to Jack. Um, Inbound from the south, says Carl, pluggers. That's what it is. Pluggers. Um, Whale whale spray plumes of ice and mud erupt all around Jack, catering the permafrost. A plugger swarm is buried in the snow all around him. It's a death sentence, and we know it. The pluggers, fist-sized chunks of metal, are already clawing their way to the surface of their impact craters. One by one, they blossom behind us, blasting leg anchors into the ground and aiming plugs at our backs. We almost make it to the hill when the first plugger launches and buries itself into Jack's left calf. When he makes that terrible croaking scream, I know it's over. Um, The pluggers self-detonate the instant their hulls are compromised. I, uh, I hit a plugger and this starts a chain reaction. A hail of icy shrapnel embeds itself in my armor and the back of my helmet. Uh, 
The plugger is chewing up the meat of his leg and orienting itself with his blood flow. With a drill-like prob- proboscis, the plugger will follow Jack's femoral artery to his heart. This process requires 45 seconds on average. And what they try to do is basically amputate the leg before it can get into his bloodstream. But it they aren't able to do it fast enough. Um, and he can tell, Cormac can, because at one point Jack starts talking and there's already blood in his mouth. So obviously this shit is not just down in his leg right now. Um, I think that the human face was never designed to convey the amount of pain that my brother is in right now. Um, (laughs) you dumb, stupid asshole, I tell him. And he says, it's too late. Just listen. You're the one, man. I knew it. You're the one. Keep my bayonet, okay? No pawn shops, which I really enjoy. Uh... My brother is dying in my arms and I'm trying to memorize his face because I know that this is really important, but I can't stop wondering if any of the pluggers on the hill are burrowing toward my squad right now. A hollow thud rocks his body as the plugger reaches his heart and detonates. Jack's body bounces off the ground in a massive convulsion. His blue eyes are suddenly injected with dark red blood. The blast is trapped inside his body armor. Now, it's the only thing holding his body together. Oh, that's messed up. They get up into your heart and then they just fucking explode there. Yikes. Christ's sake. And I've gotten a little bit ahead of myself because I just wanted to get to the part where they describe exactly how this thing operates. But... They were doing this to try and save Tiberius, who is screaming for help. And Jack, of course, is the one who wants to go and save Tiberius. And Cormac is like, dude, we can't. Like, I understand. I do. But we can't. And Jack says that something has happened to Cormac's humanity. And Cormac is kind of like... Yes, of course something has happened to my... Yes, it has. Shit's going down, man. What do you mean? Of course we have to adjust, like, the, the our expectations of what we can do for people and what we're willing to sacrifice. Yes. And he's sort of, in a way, I actually appreciated, he's willing to admit that simultaneously be sad that that is how he feels, but not be super guilty over it. And he doesn't do a lot of self-flagellating, like, what have I become? What have they done to me? You know, it's more just like, man, this is a bad call. And you're going to like hurt other people by making this bad call. Um, there, Here is the difference between Jack and me. Fuck our humanity, I say. I want to live. Don't you get it? If you go out there, they're going to kill you, Jackie. Tiberius' moan floats on the breeze like a ghost. The sound of his voice is strange, low and raspy. Jackie, he wheezes. Help me. Jackie, come out here and dance. The hell? I say. Nobody calls you Jackie but me. And this was when I was like, oh, no, I didn't think that they were using Tiberius's body. I thought that they had recorded Tiberius's voice and were like deploying that to lure them. And I sort of thought maybe this would wind up being used as a tactic. What I kept thinking of those of you who have read the Hunger Games, I think it's the second book. Um, one of the weird, like, bits of the clock sort of set up that they are in, there are birds that speak with the voices of their loved ones, like all of the contestants' loved ones, except they scream in as if they are in pain. 
And it's a perfect lure because people are just like they react instinctually at the sound of a loved one's voice in pain and they go running to help. And I kind of was like thinking that was what they were doing. I was sort of wondering like, can they even see Tiberius from where they are? Is he even there? What, you know, like, um, but what it turns out to be is that Tiberius is taken over by this thing that they are calling parasites. Um, Let's see. We're all silent for a solid 10 seconds. This is still in the um, argument, the midst of the argument. Jack wheels on Shara and the whole squad and flings his helmet to the ground. Is that what you all want? To leave Ty behind? To run away like fucking cowards? We're all silent for a solid 10 seconds. I can almost feel the tons of metal speeding through the blizzard toward our position. Survive to fight. I whisper to Jack. The others nod. Well, fuck that, mutters Jack. You all may be a bunch of robots, but I'm not. My man is calling me. He's calling for me. Move on if you have to, but I'm getting Tiberius. And I was just like, um, yeah, like, I really understand the the desire to do the no one gets left behind thing, but it's just not the time, man. It's just not. And... I'm surprised at how shaming he is on, uh, like, when he knows what's at stake. But also the fact that he would make a stand and be even more stubborn when faced with everyone else, like, turning his, turning their backs, basically, does also sort of make sense. Um, there's just a, uh, sort of, I, I'm, the only one with courage. I'm the only one who understands I'm the lone hero thing going on. Um, also, there's this line that's uh, highlighted by, it says 127 people. It's right after they realize that a plugger swarm is buried around him. I don't think I react. My action is divorced from all emotion and logic. It isn't human or inhuman. It just is. I believe that choices like these made in absolute crisis come from our true selves, bypassing all experience and thought. These kinds of choices are the closest thing to fate that human beings will ever experience. I thought that was an interesting idea. You know, um, there, the thing, the explanation that I have always turned to over the past few years about whether or not there is such a thing as fate or destiny is from the Dresden files. And he is speaking to an archangel and asking whether or not things are predestined to happen. And the archangel is like, well, no, you have free will. But the thing is that your personalities over time develop in such a way that the likelihood of you making a different decision in any given situation goes much further down than you would expect. There are fewer points for doing something surprising than one would expect. And very rarely do people actually do something surprising. Most of us have a fairly predictable way of reacting to certain events. You know, if you're like me and you're somebody who is bold and defiant, but also like maybe like not entirely, uh, like has a self-confidence problem, which I bet people are laughing, but no, seriously, I do. Um, there is a certain way that I'm going to react to a type of conflict every time. And then there are going to be people who are, they avoid conflict and so they're going to be a lot more passive aggressive. And when they get faced with a certain thing, they're always going to take the path of least resistance because they don't like being confrontational. And this results in often the same outcome, despite the fact that we have free will. It means that if you redid the scenario a hundred times, 99 times, we would do the same thing, the same type of thing that would lead in the same general direction. And he describes it as 
basically, our personalities are like these trenches dug, and the water flows down through the trenches, and you can dig a whole new trench to direct the water into a different direction. But it takes a lot of time and energy, and a lot of people don't really want to be bothered or don't consider it necessary. And that's like what therapy is, right? You go to therapy and it's you learning how to dig a new trench. You have to figure out why, wh what trench you've got going already that's directing water in the same way so that the same bullshit keeps happening to you. You keep winding up in the same type of failed relationship. You keep winding up with friends who like react in the same shitty ways to things. And once you begin to realize, oh, that trench is the one, you have to dig a new one. And that takes time and energy. And it's really tough when you're older and you've got a whole new, like, you've got to basically change fundamental parts of who you are. But when you've learned that certain parts don't serve you, then that's what you have to do or else you are, ba you're essentially agreeing, yeah, I agree to live like this forever, you know? Um, Krista says, I came here to have a good time and I feel so attacked. Look, girl, I am looking in the mirror as I say this, you know, like it's, it, this is something that I've been sort of like coping with and reading articles about since I found out that I'm pretty sure I have obsessive compulsive personality disorder and trying to stymie the like disdain and control issues that I have. And it's, really tough. And I've always sort of like felt like it wasn't really normal. But it's one thing to sort of wonder that. And it's another thing to be like, yeah, no, that's bad. That's not working for you at all. Um, so yeah, this this true selves bypassing all experience and thought. It's interesting, because what he's sort of saying is like, if you don't let yourself think too much, what you do is the truest expression of who you are. And I'm not totally sure I agree with that. I get what he's saying, but I, I don't know. I feel like we thinking doesn't mean that you aren't still doing something sort of instinctively. The way you think can be instinctive too, but overall I understand what he means. And I just thought of that. It was sort of like a, uh, an interesting take so, um, so yeah, so Jack dies and they realize that Tiberius is already dead and Shara motions to Di Tiberius's body. What looks like a writhing metal scorpion clings to his back. It's a headless tangle of wires, pincers flexing. It has barbed feet buried in the meat of his torso between his ribs Eight more insectile legs wrap around his face from behind. The thing contracts and squeezes air from Ty's lungs like an accordion. And this is when he starts talking and they are all really, really startled because like they just think that he was killed by some new weird thing. They don't quite realize yet. Um, its dexterous claws knead Ty's stubbled throat and jaw, massaging, coiling, uncoiling. A grotesque calliope begins as the barbed feet force air from his lungs through his vocal cords and out of his mouth. The corpse speaks. Turn back, it says, face twisting grotesquely, or die. I hear a splatter on the snow and inhale the sharp scent of vomit from one of my squad mates. You think? <laughs> I would be so... Like... Rude. Just... That is very rude. You know? I just can't... How dare you? Ugh, I hate it. And, and, you know, I am definitely somebody who often jokes about how if I were to die, you could just flush my ashes down the toilet. I really don't care. It's fine. Who gives a shit after a certain point? It's for the living, right? But 
I think I've just found the exception to me not caring. And it's this. If I was like looking down from heaven and saw that this happened to me, I would just be like, oh, oh, uh uh-uh, no, I don't think so. And I would find a way to come back down and make that shit right because I don't think so, kids. No. I am Arcos, god of the robots. I love this. Arcos is calling himself god of the robots. And I'm like, that's new, first of all. Right? I don't feel like Arcos has, like, said anything like that before. So I have to assume that this is something that Arcos has done sort of because of the fact that some of the others have had an awakening. He can't just say that he's, like, the mind of all robots. He's a separate thing. This is sort of reminding me of the idea of the, uh, you know, the the forbidden fruit and how Adam and Eve came to be conscious and the separation from God that that's supposed to represent. Like, you know, being in the Garden of Eden was it's symbolic for being one with God and they chose to gain a consciousness that separated them from God and it granted them awareness and freedom, but also drew a sort of veil between them and their creator. And that sort of feels like what has happened with the freeborn and this whole thing with him suddenly being like, Oh, I'm God of the robots. It's interesting to, consider maybe God did not consider itself separate from people until the Garden of Eden apple eating happened. You know, if we're going with the like literal version of the story, like Adam and Eve were simply reflections of a part of God. And then they eat this thing and God is suddenly not united with them. And now God is like, well, what am I? I guess I'm God and has to give itself a name, which, uh, I mean, again, there's something very sort of arrogant feeling about it. Like they didn't agree to that. And the, the freeborn don't see Arcos as a God. They're just like, no, you're literally trying to enslave us. This is not. No. Um, mm, I don't know. There's something there. So the this ends with Bright Boy Squad had been torn apart and refor in the crucible of the battle on the snowy hill, Bright Boy Squad had been torn apart and reforged into something different from before. Something calm and lethal, unblinking. We walked into a nightmare. When we left, we brought it with us, and now we are eager to share our nightmare with the enemy. I assumed control of Bright Boy Squad that day. After the death of Tiberius Abdullah and Jack Wallace, the squad never again hesitated to make any sacrifice necessary in our fight against the robot menace. The fiercest fighting and the hardest choices were yet to come. Um, So then we have Chapter 2, Freeborn, And I'm like behind on the number of chapters considering how long I have left, but I've really talked extensively about these chapters as a whole. So I'm not that worried about it. Um, But this is, this chapter is when 902 figures out how to approach Cormac's crew and get them on board as allies. Um, And it's written, the the preface is written by Cormac again. He says, our wounds were raw. And although that's no excuse, I hope history won't judge our actions harshly. So basically, they hear people coming. um, Reminder, because 902 is with two, I think. Uh, Hoplite 611. uh, Heavily Armored Warden 333. And, okay, I think that's everybody. Um, 
So what they do is take themselves offline to make them seem like they are inactive, probably injured or, you know, killed somehow. And 902 remains as the, I mean, liaison, I guess, is the word I want. Um, and they see Hop, they see 902, and he is distant enough that he says, help. And it says the leader blinks as if he's been slapped in the face. Then he speaks calmly and quietly. Leo, kill it. My pleasure, Cormac. So 902 does not fight back or do anything. He sort of lets himself look more disabled than he is so that he seems like less of a threat. And Cormac picks up pretty quickly on the fact that he isn't fighting back or doing anything at all to defend himself. And tells Leo to stop because he wants to investigate a little bit further. Shara, understandably, is like, you want to investigate this thing that definitely has a bomb implanted in it. Which uh, I was like, that's a good point. Like, there's been a lot of bomb-ish shit. I can understand why that's what she thinks is going on here. I probably would also. And he comes over and is talking to 902, um, asks, are you broken? 902 says, negative, I am alive. That effect, initiate command mode, human control, robot, hop on one leg, now, chop, chop. You have a devious sort of intelligence, don't you, Cormac, I ask. The human makes a loud, repetitive noise. This noise makes the others come nearer. I have to... Like, this loud, repetitive noise, is that laughter? I, I'm i not... Oh, Krista says yes. Okay. Oh, he's an arbiter. Yeah, that just feels so sinister, though. An arbiter sounds like the title in, like, a, a fantasy series. And it's somebody who definitely just, like, kills people. <laughs> I don't know. Um... But it takes a little while, and eventually Cormac holds a gun to 902's head and sort of plays chicken to see whether or not 902 will, like, attempt to attack him to defend itself. Um, Cormac moves his palm to the side, and I observe that the clip is missing from the pistol. Max Prob indicates he never intended to fire at all. Alive. You just said the magic word. Get up, he said. I was like, not totally understanding. Because the thing is that if this being really did want to stay alive, fighting back against Cormac when he's about to pull the trigger wouldn't be proof that he's a bad robot. It would just be proof that he has a like desire for self-preservation. So I, I didn't really feel like this test made a lot of sense to me. I, I don't know how else I could have, you know, if I were writing this, how I would have made it go, but it just felt to me like a sort of, um, the, the fact that he doesn't move at all, I guess, is meant to indicate that the self-preservation comes second. Um, I don't, but it just, I don't know. It didn't entirely work for me. It doesn't really matter because all of this is simply meant to be a method of showing us that th how the human beings were convinced he was for real. Um, so he stands up. And everybody is just like, Cormac, what are you doing? And he explains what the deal is, that they think, that he thinks we, were, we are looking for an edge and we have finally found it. And Cormac says, if we could only find more, and I love this so much, Cormac, I croak. The humans turn to look at me. Their laughter dries up. 
The smiles fade so quickly into worry. I issue a tight beam radio command. Hoplite and Warden, my squad mates, begin to stir. They sit up in the snow and wipe away the dirt and frost. They make no sudden movements and offer no surprises. They simply rise as though they had been asleep. Bright boy squad, I announce. Meet freeborn squad. Um, Krista says it's a, it's long-term preservation. He talks to his squad about it beforehand. You mean 902 talks to his squad about it? Yeah, but I mean, like, what it is that Cormac is thinking this proves. You know what I mean? I just feel like if I were, if, because the whole thing is that this thing is trying to prove to you that it is actually alive and that it's looking for allies because it wants to stay alive and not be submissive to Arcos. And to me, seeing if it will tolerate you shooting it doesn't indicate that it is alive. It's just in like, for me, it has got self preservation Like, I just, I don't think that I would use that method. It wouldn't prove what it apparently proved to Cormac. It doesn't, it, you know, like it just is sheer luck that Cormac had no, like decided that this was how he was going to test the thing instead of actually carrying through a threat, which if they were dealing with a slightly different crowd probably would be what happened. Um, I don't know. It's just a com like a sort of uh, all of these different things coming together that that just happened to work out based on personality type. But you know that's life, I guess. So, chapter three: They shall not grow old. This is when things begin to go really, really left. And I am not going to read all of the, you know, all of the action, but basically this is when they learn that there are zombifiers and it is really messed up. Um, I really like this whole idea of basically reanimating corpses and coming at you and if you take down the body, it can just reanimate them in a slightly different way so that they get up again and keep moving. It's really horrifying. The bodies absorb our bullets and they bleed and bones shatter and meat falls. But those monsters inside them keep picking them back up and bringing them back. We'll be out of ammo soon at this rate. So... They're in contact with Matilda at this point, and they're telling her, we need reinforcements. Is anybody out there? You're close, says Matilda, but it gets worse from here. Worse than this? We can't make it, Matilda. Our tank is down. We're stuck. If we move, we'll get infected. Not all of you are stuck. And this is when they look around and realize that Arbiter and Warden and Hoplite uh, are standing there waiting for orders and let's see 902 fuck it we've got this covered take freeborn squad and get your ass to arcos and when you get there fuck him up for me and i love this so much when i finally have the courage to look back down to where shara lies hurt and bleeding i'm surprised she's grinning at me tears in his eye tears in her eyes so then we go to chapter four, Dyad. And this is wild. So I I really liked this because it's sort of, <laughs> you got chocolate in my peanut butter. You got peanut butter in my chocolate. Like the humanity is going back and forth between the machines. The machines are going back and forth between the humanity. Um, so we get a description of 902 absolutely sprinting and the ways in which he can like repair himself as he continues, which is pretty wild too. And unfortunately there, there are some pretty like there's shells that come down, I think. And both of his companions wind up getting taken out. Um, so he gets hit also, and he thinks he's dying. 
survival survival probability probability fades to nil. Get up, says a voice in my mind. Query identify. My name is Matilda. I want to help you. There's no time. Query, are you human? Listen, concentrate. And my darkness ignites with information. A topographical satellite map overlays my vision, expanding to the horizon and beyond. My own internal sensors paint an estimated image of what I look like. Internals like diagnostics and what is this word? Proprioception. What does that mean? I didn't even catch that the first time are still online. Holding up my arm, I see its virtual representation, flat shaded and without detail. Looking up, I see a dotted line creeping across the vivid blue sky. Query, what is the dotted incoming missile, says the voice. I'm back on my feet and running inside 1.3 seconds. Top speed is slashed due to the snapped strut in my leg, but I am mobile. And this is when she tells him to repair himself and he gets out this little, like, uh, you know, plasma torch and repairs like while he is in en route, as they say. Um, Arcos hiding place is in sight. Overhead, I count three more dotted lines, efficiently tracing their way toward my current position. On your toes, 902, says Matilda. You've got to take Arcos antenna offline. One click to go. The female child commands me and I choose to obey. With Matilda's guidance, 902 was able to negotiate the maze of ravines and avoid drone-fired missiles until he reached Arcos's bunker. Once there, the Arbiter disabled the antenna, temporarily disrupting the robot armies. 902 survived by forming the first example of what became known as the Dyad, a human-machine fighting team. Um, oh, Ms. T says, the feeling of where your body is in space. Oh, interesting. Okay. So then we get the final chapter, and this is when they are all intending to climb down and deal with Rob, because, reminder, the brain is basically sunk into this, like, pit in the ground. And eventually, thank God, 902 is like, uh, this is not good for you guys, actually. You should check. The engineer pulls out a tool, looks at it, and then scrambles away from the depression. Radiation, he says, elevated and growing toward the center of the hole. We can't be here. And finally, 902 is like, I'm going I'm to do it. And Cormac tries to tell him, you don't have to. And he's like, I know. Guess what? And he goes in and there are a lot of physical obstacles that it looks like we're not sure he's going to be able to make it. But finally he gets to see a hologramic uh, boy. He says hologramic. Um, it squats down and sits next to me. Don't worry, 902. Your leg will be fine soon. Did you create me? I ask. No, replies the boy. All the pieces needed to make you were available. I simply put them into the right combination. And understandably, Arcos is like, look, I get that you feel like you guys are on the same side, but you can't like actually trust human beings to treat you like equals once this is all over. You have a, a common enemy right now. And once that's gone... They're going to want to subjugate you again. It is not enough to live together in peace with one race on its knees. That's a great line, by the way. And Arcos basically, like, it seems like he sort of thinks that, first of all, he's buying time. And this is something that... um 902 can tell, but he isn't sure exactly why or what he's doing. A soul isn't given for free, says the boy. Humans discriminate, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and he can feel this sort of thrumming as he puts it in the ground. I'm finally able to drag myself onto my feet. 
The boy makes calming motions with his hands, and I stagger through the projection. I sense that this is a diversion, a trick. I pick up a gl green glinting rock, hurl it into the revolving maelstrom of yellow and silver plates in the back wall into Arcos's eye. Sparks fly from the hole, and the image of the boy flickers. I am my own, I say. And he keeps throwing rocks. I am free. Now I will always be free. I am alive. You will never control my kind again. An observation thread notices the faltering hologram is crying simulated tears. We have a beauty that does not die, Arbiter. The humans are jealous of that. And I'm just like, that isn't, what? That's, no. You are making a lot of sense. And honestly, I'm not sure I disagree with you. But when you said that, I was like, mm, I don't think so. Um, the hologram watches me sadly, its beams of light writhing and twitching. Then you will be free, it says in a computerized, unmodulated voice. The boy blinks out of existed of, of existence. Um, so he gets pulled back to the surface and he tells Cormac what the machine warned, warned him about. And Cormac is sort of like, there's a moment where, where Cormac's like, mm, I kind of understand what he meant, but I think once people know what you did, that's not going to be a problem. And I am not sure that I agree with that. That's one of those things where I'm like, maybe intellectually, I don't think that's necessarily going to work. Too many people have had their own run-ins with their own bad robots. One good robot, I just don't feel like that's, I don't know. I don't know. I guess we'll see. Um, I mean, I'm with my sort of paranoia, I could see in this position, me thinking this might be part of an even longer con. But so then we go into the debriefing and 902 has buried his friends, says goodbye um, and Matilda Perez has shown him where other freeborns are. So he's heading over there in order to maybe be a leader. Um, and Cormac is just staring at this hole in the ground, thinking about how he never even met Arcos. It was just like that one creepy time that, uh, the, his dead friend was taken over and he turns around and Shara is standing there. And she has waited for him this whole time. And evidently, this is the first time that they have ever actually expressed how they feel about one another. I kind of thought that on the road, it, pro it like had become apparent. Maybe they weren't, you know, they're, they're not going to the movies and shit. But I thought that they might be seen as a pair. And I mean, 902 does sort of see them as a pair when he's in his perspective. But yeah, evidently it was just not official in any sense. So they hold hands and he realizes that his humanity is not all gone. And that is the end of the book. So yeah, it was, uh, I thought that was a pretty satisfying ending. Like I said, it was a little bit sudden. I would have liked more time to explore other things. But considering, um, I think that was done well. You know, it's a pretty tight story. So, Krista says, call back to Arcos's creator's convo. Sorry, Krista, I do not remember where I was when you said that. Um, what Arcos says to 902. I'm not remembering, though. I'm sorry. It's the same thing the first scientist to Arcos in the first chapter. What is the same thing? What does he say? I'm trying to, <laughs> I did not create you. Oh, 
Oh, I didn't remember that. Okay. Huh. Interesting. I like that. Um, all right. I am way over time, so I have to run. But thank you again, Krista, for commissioning this. And let me know if you ever do decide that you want to do the uh, sequel. And yeah, I really enjoyed this. It was a lot of fun. It will definitely make me slightly more paranoid in future, but it's not always a bad thing. And until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.